Right, okay. I've unmuted now. We're ready to crack on. Sorry for the delay, a bit of a technical error there. Uh, but welcome to this museum presentation uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Harry Futcher Regimental Museum. I was going to talk about um, if, any, if we have any techie issues, but hopefully we've got all those out of the way now. The presentation is going to last about 40 minutes and then there'll be opportunity for questions at the end. And uh, I am recording this, uh, this presentation, so you should be aware of that. Okay, moving on. Right, okay. The Herefordshire Regiment. It was formed in 1908 and it's a single battalion territorial regiment. It was formed as part of 160 Welsh Border Brigade, but in April 1915 it transferred to 158 North Wales Brigade. And the other three battalions in that brigade were all of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And those brigades were part of the 53rd Welsh Division. Now, the 53rd Welsh Division, all the units in it were territorial units. So although this is the story of the Herefordshire Regiment, the story applies equally to a greater or lesser extent to all of the units in 53rd Welsh Division. But first, we need to look a little bit at the history of the Herefordshire Regiment to understand the character and the makeup of the, of the regiment and the people in the battalion. The story starts in 1860 with the formation of the Herefordshire Rifle Volunteer Corps. This was formed to counter a perceived invasion threat from the French. When the invasion threat disappeared, the Rifle Volunteer Corps stayed in existence. And the Herefordshire Rifle Volunteer Corps covered both Herefordshire and Radnorshire. The individuals making up the unit were quite innovative, and this is demonstrated by two particular things. First of all, this body of men who were the bearer company, the stretcher bearer company. Generally, units had no dedicated stretcher bearers. They allocated men from the companies. The Herefordshire Rifle Volunteer Corps created a dedicated stretcher bearer company. They were drilled in casualty evacuation and also basic first aid. They later became the Welsh Border Brigade Field Ambulance, part of the um, Royal Army Medical Corps. The second organisation was the Cyclist Company. And again, the Herefordshire Regiment were one of the first units in the British Army to form a cyclist section. And they took part in the first War Department cyclist camp, which took place at Tinton Abbey. So already you can see that the men of Herefordshire have a, a, a Wilco and a forward leaning approach. In 1899, the Boer War broke out and there were insufficient troops to fight in South Africa. And the regulars called for volunteers to go out to augment them. And 40 men from the Herefordshire Rifle Volunteer Corps joined with 80 men from the Shropshire Rifle Volunteer Corps to form a volunteer service company which served in South Africa for 12 months. And two volunteer service companies went out, one in 1900 and one in 1901. As a result of service in South Africa, a reorganization of both the regular army and the reserve army took place. And in 1908, Haldane's army reforms were implemented and the rifle volunteers and the militia were disbanded and the territorial <coughs> the territorial force was formed and included in the in the territorial force was the first battalion of the Herefordshire regiment it had no regular uh, battalion attached to it <coughs> so the first battalion was the territorial battalion the officers took for their cap badge the city coat of arms badge as seen there 
and the other ranks took the badge from the top of the um <coughs> so excuse me from the top of the, the coat of arms there as their badge right okay we're back on stream <coughs> Uh, when the 1st Battalion was formed, it covered Herefordshire and Radnorshire, and the location of the units are shown on this slide here. The top picture there is effectively Suvla Barracks, which was the old militia headquarters barracks. The two photographs below it are what was the rifle volunteer barracks in Friar Street in Hereford. Mm. Uh, the first recruiting parade was or the first annual camp was a recruiting parade around the county and the Hereford Times issued a supplement as you can see here. The recruiting parade might not have been the success that it was thought to be as when they camped overnight outside the, the um, Old Hart pub in Hall Withy, when the landlord could produce no more beer all his windows were broken and the, the regiment had to pay out of their funds for the windows to be repaired to the tune of one pound 13 and sixpence these are some photographs of the recruiting parade here uh, when they when they marched when they passed through Hereford. sorry ledbury <laughs> the character of the battalion was very much a family organization and here you can see william gag and his seven sons who were all members of the regiment but there were brothers, fathers and sons, uncles, cousins. It was very much a family battalion. Later on in the First World War, they formed the Powell's Battalion, battalions, which were made up of local men. But the territorial battalions were also made up of local men, but perhaps not so concentrated as the Powell's battalions. Before the First World War, they carried out their training generally going to uh, annual camps and weekend camps. This picture shows the stretcher bearers. And when the territorial force was formed, there was no obligation for, ser for them to serve overseas. They were for home defense only. However, individuals could sign on for what was called imperial service. And if they did, they wore this badge on their right breast and they were known as imperial servicemen and many of the Herefordshire regiment signed up for imperial service. In August 1914 war was declared and the 1st Battalion of the Herefordshire regiment was mobilised. As you can see there officers received a telegram telling them to mobilise and soldiers received a notice of embodiment as shown there on the right. Interestingly enough, the form of embodiment were all sent out by post and they were signed by Major Pattisall on the 4th of August. They were sent out and the individuals were required to report by 6.30 on the 5th of August the next day. I think they had more confidence in the post office then than we perhaps have now. The soldiers reported for duty to their local territorial army centres, their local drill halls. It's reported that from the Herefordshire Regiment, there was over 95% reporting of, uh, of soldiers. Some of the men who didn't report, one was working in Scotland and two were ill that we know of. But again, this shows the spirit of the battalion 
as some battalions only had a 65 or a 70 percent turnout rate. The troops concentrated in their drill halls and then moved to Hereford by train and concentrated there. At the time, such was the enthusiasm in the country that literally thousands of men, generally young men, volunteered to join up. And here we have some photographs of men in Herefordshire who wanted to join the Herefordshire Regiment. They formed up in their local towns and then travelled to Hereford, Hereford to sign up at the drill halls. However, the regular soldiers or the members of the territorial force had been called up and had deployed to their war station. So there was no one in Hereford to receive them or very few people left in Hereford to receive them. There was no equipment and no instructors, no uniforms and no accommodation. They found retired servicemen and pulled them out of retirement. They dug them out of retirement and these men were known as dugouts. They then gave them instructions, generally only in drill. And you can see here recruits to the Herefordshire Regiment drilling on Castle Green in Hereford. I mentioned there was no accommodation and recruits were accommodated in the drill halls and in the Lord Scudamore School and tents were put up in the ground of Lord Scudamore School, as you can see there. But all of these things started to add up to the character of the battalion. These young men who probably knew each other, joined up together, went through the same experiences and through those experiences formed that camaraderie. Over 2,000 individuals volunteered for service with the Herefordshire Regiment between August and December 1914 and the commanding officer and the men from the 1st Battalion who wore the Herefordshire with a T above it showed a title. The men in the 1st Battalion were a bit miffed that those in the 2nd Battalion were now also wearing Herefordshire with a T above it and there was nothing to distinguish them from the 1st Battalion. So the commanding officer ordered the soldiers in the 1st Battalion to file down the T to make it into a 1. And there we can see an example of a filed down shoulder title. The men that had been mobilised moved on to the east of England to undergo further training. There were probably about 600 men in the battalion at this time. Their war establishment would have been about a thousand men. Of those 500 men, there were probably some which were unfit to deploy overseas. There were also some which hadn't signed the Imperial Service commitment. So about six or 700 men from the second battalion all of those eager recruits from 19, from August and September, were poured forward to the 1st Battalion. They underwent training and administration, and the top photograph there, you can see men receiving their inoculations. The, the bottom photograph is the tug of war team. And on the right, you can see a body of men that undertook fatigues and the battalion was involved in digging the east of England and the North London defences. So these young men, these young volunteers joined them and undertook the training with them. But their training was of an individual basis and a basic formation training. There was no accommodation for them and they were billeted in private houses. Again, great camaraderie was built up by them living together and working together and sharing hardships. This is the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Drake, who had served for 23 years in the Royal Marine Light Infantry, mainly as an intelligence officer. He had retired from the Royal Marines in uh, 1913 
and joined the Herefordshire Regiment as the second in command. On the outbreak of war, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and took command. We're now into the early years of 1915, and the war on the Western Front had developed into stalemate. The armies had exhausted themselves, and the initial war supplies had all been expended. So they were looking for alternative ways to break the stalemate. And one of the options which was considered was the Gallipoli campaign. The idea was to force the Dardanelles to reinforce Russia. The operation itself was not seen to be a war winner, but by reinforcing Russia, it was seen that the Germans would have to keep more troops on the Eastern Front. Also, by forcing through the Dardanelles, Turkey would be out of, taken out of the war and all of the Allied troops which were employed or deployed to Turkey and the Middle East could then be redeployed to the Western Front. Thus, the Western Front would be strengthened and the war could be won on the Western Front. So the Gallipoli campaign was never considered to be a war winner. The idea for the Gallipoli campaign was to start with purely naval a purely naval action and French and British battleships would enter the Narrows and they would open fire and destroy the Turkish gun batteries on the shore sides there. The Turkish however had laid mines right the way through the Narrows and you can see the lines of mines on that diagram there. The ships would come in four abreast and they would always turn to starboard and then come out of the Narrows line astern. One enterprising Turkish officer noticed this and had an extra line of mines laid. And on the 18th of March, the ships went in, turned to the starboard, went line abreast and crossed the line of mines and three capital ships were lost. As a result of that, the Navy decided that they couldn't carry on a maritime campaign. They withdrew and it was decided that a land campaign would go on. And the dates here are quite interesting. The final naval attempt took place on the 18th of March. The landings did not take place to the 25th of April, over five weeks later. And this timing is significant for two reasons. Firstly, it gave the Turks five weeks to prepare their defences. Secondly, it meant that the complete Allied force from its commander to its fighting unit, to its logistics support, to its shipping, and to determining, determining a plan, all had to be decided within five weeks. A very heavy task. The initial landings were to take place in the south of the peninsula at Cape Helles, and further to the north, in a bay which became known as Anzac Cove. The landings to the south were, uh, were met with a mixed response. Some units were met by heav heavy rifle and machine gun fire, others were virtually unopposed. This picture here is at Lancashire Landing and you can see the, uh, the troops huddled under the sea embankment there. These pictures are with Anzac Cove and many of the troops were landed in the wrong place. And if you can look at the ground there, the cliffs are almost on the shoreline there. There's almost no shoreline at all. And it meant that Anzac was a very difficult place to operate. 
However, after a couple of months, there was stalemate at the peninsula. And they looked to break that stalemate and send in extra troops with an extra landing. At this time in July, the Herefordshire Regiment were in Northampton, in Newmarket. And they were issued with tropical kit. The rumour was that they were going to be sent to India to relieve regular troops. However, when they sailed from Devonport on the uh, troop ship, the Euripides, they were told that they were headed for Gallipoli. And they sailed through the Mediterranean to Egypt to form up. This was the first time for many of them that they had been to sea. For many of them, it's probably the first time that they'd been a long distance from Herefordshire. And again, this led to great camaraderie amongst them all, building on the experiences of their training over the last 12 months. The second landing was to take place at Suvla Bay, and you can see the bay marked on this map. The idea was that the new troops landing at Suvla Bay would join with the troops from Anzac Cove. They would cut off the peninsula and then they would go down the high ground to the south, rolling up the Turkish troops. By this, they could take out all of the land artillery pieces that were firing into the, uh, the, the narrows, the waterway, and thus the Navy could then force the narrows. A little bit about the geography of Suvla Bay. And I show this map, it's, it's a, a little bit dirty and grubby, but it is one of the officers' maps who, which was carried at Suvla Bay. And there are on it various pencil marks and markings, which I've actually not been able to decipher, but that's the reason which I show this map. The bay is dominated by the Salt Lake, which in August was dry. The whole area is like a half a saucer, with the high ground to the north and the east. The bay is about two and a half to three miles from the bay across the Salt Lake to the high ground. So the whole theatre of operations there, the whole bay is about three to three and a half miles east to west, and perhaps four miles north to south. And there's a photograph of Suvla Bay there, which is taken from the high ground at Anzac. And you can see the beach to the left there and the Salt Lake to the right. The initial landings were carried out by the 10th and the 11th Division and they were generally successful. They landed and secured a, a beachhead, and they set in place uh, defensive lines to secure those beachheads. One battalion in the north followed the ridge to the north for about three miles, almost unopposed. At this stage, there were only two companies of Turks holding the high ground. The initial assault had, came, had come as a complete surprise to the Turks. And the divisions went ashore, established their beachhead. And then the follow on troops, which included the first 53rd Division, were to follow on and were then to assault through the 11th and 10th Division and take the high ground. However, this is when the problems occurred. The new chief of staff of the headquarters directing this operation had come from the Western Front. His experiences on the Western Front led him to believe that you could only carry out an assault with heavy artillery support. There was no artillery support landed in the first waves. So the chief of staff held back the troops. The next confusion was originally the landing beaches were as shown here. 
A, B, and C. However, the Royal Navy decided that B Beach was not suitable, so they moved it. So there was A, C, and B beaches, as shown here. However, many of the troops were not told of this change. So they were landing on B Beach, expecting to see a certain uh, uh, geography in front of them, but they didn't, they landed on B Beach. Those individuals landing in C Beach expected to be on the right flank and suddenly found that there were friendly troops to their right. Again, there was confusion. The troops were also mixed up. There were brigades who didn't have all of their battalions. There were companies which were separated from their brigades. And all in all, there was complete disorder right the way across the, the area. The commanders didn't seem to know what was going on and failed to get a grip of the troops. They then committed troops piecemeal into action. And one of the principles of, uh, of assault is to maintain a strong force, a strong concentrated force. But none of the brigades and certainly not the divisions were intact. They were all penny packeted around the whole theater. And therefore there was no concentration of power to assault the Turks. By this time as well, the Turks had won the race and their reinforcements had come from the north and had occupied all of the high ground and the opportunity had been lost. These are a few photographs of troops landing at Suvla Bay. It is not the Herefordshire Regiment, but it would have been similar for them. But the assault was not like the first 20 minutes of the film Saving Private Ryan. In most cases, the landing was unopposed. I show this picture because written on the back of it is the first hour ashore. And you would expect soldiers in their first hour ashore to be far more active and enthusiastic than they are shown there. Now on to the Herefords part in all of this. The Herefords had transferred to the Snay Fell, which was an Isle of Man steam packet, to land forward at Suvla Bay. It had run aground and therefore they were delayed and they were the last battalion of the 53rd Division to land. The photograph at the top there is the Herefords actually landing or being rowed ashore to land at Suvla Bay. When they landed at Sea Beach, as shown here, they didn't know what to do. It was about six o'clock in the morning and they landed. The commanding officer didn't have any maps and he didn't have any orders. The troops gathered on the beach and assembled there and got themselves sorted out. They sat down and had lunch, uh, which they brought with them from the ships. And then they basically, they wandered around. And one veteran who I spoke to said that it was a little bit like a Sunday school trip to the seaside. The sea was blue, there was sand and sand dunes. And he wandered up to the top of Lala Barba, which was a big sand dune. And there were spits in the sand all around him. And he said he was shouted at in a very soldierly terms and told to get off the hill because he was attracting sniper fire. And he said to me, that's when I realized that it was for real. Anyway, the Herefords are now ashore and they concentrate in the area of Lala Barba. The commanding officer by this stage had gone to the divisional headquarters and asked what he was to do. And he was given the following order. Um, Colonel Bosenquet of the Sherwood Foresters is anxious about his right flank. He's near the K or D of the Asmak Dare. 
Place yourself in communication with him. I do not think he will have much to do or will get a dusting. Get away as quickly as possible. So yet again, troops were being fed in piecemeal and not concentrated. So the Herefords then move forward and that's the line there of the Asmac Dare. The Herefords move forward. And this are some pictures of the Asmac Dare here. The top picture shows the actual dare, which is a dried river course. It's about 15 feet across and about eight feet deep. The bottom picture on the right there, that tree line is the Asmac Dare. And in the distance, you can see the high ground, which was occupied by the Turks. But going back to the top left hand picture there, you can see the nature of the ground. Undulating, uh, spread with low level bushes, and also with a with a, thish, a vicious thorn bush. So the Herefords move forward, and during this move forward, they came under fire for the first time under artillery fire. The scrub was set on fire. There was dust, there was heat and broken ground, and the troops got dispersed. One party of the Herefords, about 80 men, got separated and and moved to the north and they actually joined up with a battalion of the South Wales borderers and fought with them for three days. So again you can see how disorganized the, the whole situation was. When they reached the Asmac Dare the commanding officer hadn't found the Sherwood Foresters so he moved forward of the Asmac Dare by about 400 meters he still didn't find the Sherwood Foresters. So he decided to retire to the Asmac Dare to form a defensive line there. When they retired there, the commanding officer, the adjutant and the second in command were all wounded by artillery fire and went back to the first aid post at the beach. When they were establishing the defensive line, a staff officer appeared on a horse and asked them who they were and what they were doing there. The officer in command explained what they were doing and the staff officer told them that they were in the wrong place, they shouldn't be there, they were required back at the beach and they were, ret they were to return to the beach. They then returned to the beach and when they got to the beach, they, they, they retired in darkness. When they got back to the beach, the, um, the, the officer in command went to the divisional headquarters to get fresh orders, only to be met by <coughs> being asked why he'd come back to the beach, because he should have been at the Asmac Dare and that he was to advance back to the Asmac Dare at first light. This little stately dance cost the Herefordshire Regiment about 300 casualties. Not all fatalities, very few fatalities in fact, but about 300 men were wounded to no gain whatsoever. The strength of the battalion when they landed was about 750 men. So they lost 40% of their fighting strength and gained absolutely nothing. And this was typical of many of the units at Suvla Bay. I spoke to two veterans who took part in this and both of them told me independently. They said, we were very clever when we landed at Suvla Bay. We advanced in daylight. We went back to the beach at night in the darkness so the Turks couldn't see us. And then we advanced again the next morning. Uh, to, and we were trying to trick the Turks into thinking that more men had landed. They believed that for 60 years and I hadn't the heart to tell them that that wasn't the case. Amongst those casualties that went forward were men who had been with the battalion for some time. On the left is Captain Archer Croft and he was last seen by his batman disappearing up a re-entrant towards the Turks. And he was never seen again and his body was never found. On the right is Sergeant Major Faulkner 
and his son Sergeant Faulkner sat down who was the drum major and stood up behind the seat is the other son Sergeant Faulkner. Sergeant Faulkner stood up at the back was actually with the 2nd Battalion in Oswestry but Company Sergeant Major Faulkner and Sergeant Faulkner were at Suvla Bay and I will read an extract of a letter which was published in the Hereford Times written by Sergeant Faulkner. In simple but graphic language, Sergeant Charles A. Faulkner tells how his father, Company Sergeant Major Faulkner, fell during the plucky but disastrous dash of the Herefords. He wrote on August 11th to his mother, brothers and sisters, and though naturally very much upset at the loss of his father, tries to comfort his people at home. I hardly know how to start this letter, he says. I am so much upset. We landed at 6 a.m. Our Navy was very busy shelling the hills. We were drawn up on the, on the shore <coughs> and were not there more than an hour when the enemy started shelling us. Some of the Welsh, I believe, were killed. The first to be hit in our regiment was Stanley Mails out of the market. But after a little while, the shelling died down. We had dinner, which we brought with us off the boat. Then towards evening, we were ordered to get ready to go into the firing line. Dad and I were together up till then. We extended over some very rough country. I should think we had got about two miles when the enemy started to shell us with shrapnel shells. We had to drop down and take our luck. Well, ma'am, I could hardly steady myself to tell you that one of the bullets from the shells hit dad. So after the Turks stopped shelling, I got a little further up, dodging the snipers. I saw young Phelps coming back bleeding, shot in the arm. He said, I have got hit. Go up along there. I believe your father is wounded. I went on but couldn't find him anywhere. The next morning I was told he had been picked up quite dead. I think that's a good example there of the experiences that the men had when they moved forward on that first advance. The Herefords had, dis had excelled themselves and shown themselves to be a good battalion and they were brought to the attention of Sir Ian Hamilton and mentioned in his dispatches as shown there. Now, the Suvla campaign then settled down into stalemate. And I show this map again with all of these goose eggs on it, because each of these locations is mentioned in the Hereford's War Diary. So they were in each of those locations during their period on the peninsula. The five goose eggs to the right there are the frontline trenches. And the two on the coastline are what was known as rest camps or support areas. But nowhere in the theatre was out of artillery fire. So although they were rest camps, they were still under enemy artillery fire. This is a supply area to the north. And you can see the established docks there. The time that they spent out of the line was not really at rest. They undertook fatigues, water carrying duties, casualty evacuation, ammunition parties, defense store parties. And certainly uh, one of the veterans which I spoke to said that he preferred his time in the front line to his time out of the, out of the front where they had all these heavy fatigues to undertake. 
The medical facilities were fairly rudimentary as shown here. If soldiers were evacuated, they went to these tented camps. They were then evacuated from the peninsula as quickly as possible. There were few dedicated hospital ships. So they were evacuated on whatever shipping was available and wherever it was going to. And soldiers were evacuated to Cyprus, to Egypt, to Malta, and some even on ships straight back to UK. At about this time, the second and probably the biggest enemy started to show itself. And this was poor health and dysentery. Probably every soldier on the peninsula suffered at some stage from dysentery. The conditions were appalling. There was heat, there was a shortage of water, and there were dead bodies and filth everywhere. I spoke to one veteran who told me that if you went ill, you were very rarely evacuated with, uh, with if you had dysentery. You went to the medical centre or the tents, you were given a pill and told to return to duty. And in his own words, he said the pills were next to bloody useless. But they had to soldier on. The food was dreadful. As well as there being a shortage of water, they had no fresh food. They survived mainly on bully beef and dry biscuits. The bully beef was like corned beef. And again, I spoke to a veteran who told me when they drew the beef, the tins of beef, they punctured the cans, they poured the melted fat out, and then tried to eat what was left. But of course, it was salty and there was no water. The hard tack biscuits can probably best be described as something like a bonio biscuit. Hard, absolutely solid, and again, salty. And this, is, this was to be their diet for almost four months. They also had jam to spread on their biscuits, tins of jam. And again, I spoke to one veteran and said, to try and make conversation, I said to him, what type of jam did you have? What flavor? And he said, we had black jam. And I said, what was it, black currant or blackberry? And he said, no, it was black, because as soon as you opened the tin up, it was, actually, it was absolutely covered in flies and was black, you couldn't see anything. So these poor food conditions, the, 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 the appalling physical conditions and insanitary conditions soon led to poor health among the troops. And not only had their numbers been depleted uselessly by uh, fighting the initial battles, they were now being depleted by sickness. Towards the end of November, the stalemate had really set in. And at the end of November, the Herefordshire regiments were in these particular trenches here. The frontline trenches at the bottom uh, or the, the lowland, the foothills of the high ground, which was occupied by the Turks. They went forward and took these took these trenches over and it started to rain in the end of November, an absolute downpour, which flooded out the Turkish trenches and washed everything down into the British trenches. And there were talks of dead bodies, dead mules, and all sorts of detritus being washed down into the trenches. Private Edwards, who was there, spoke about this with his um he was in a, a a trench which he shared with his brother and they suddenly came out of the trench to see four, a four foot wall of water coming down the trench they were soaking wet they got out of the trench they sat on the uh, the, the ground outside the trench they could see the turks doing the same thing by the light from lightning from the storm They survived that night with the storm and the next day 
it started to snow and it froze. The men were soaking wet. Many of them were still in their summer uniforms, which they'd landed in in August. They were also in a debilitated state. So the cold and the wet really finished many of them off. They were eventually relieved in the frontline trenches and withdrew to the beach area. They, they were camped out overnight in the, sand, in the sand dunes. They came across rations which had been left there, including jars of rum. And some of the Herifords and members of other units broke open the rum containers and uh, had their fill. Unfortunately, alcohol in those conditions was not good and many of them died as a result of exposure. These are some photographs here of the aftermath of that storm. You can see them trying to dry out their blankets and seek cover where they can. The decision had been, been made to evacuate from Gallipoli. Suvla Bay was first to be evacuated and Hellas was evacuated later. On the 12th of December, the Herefordshire Regiment, or what was left of them, were evacuated from Sea Beach. There were 79 fit men which were evacuated. And Captain Ashton, the adjutant, wrote, we packed up, not having much to pack, and embarked about 8 p.m. on a single beetle, which is a, a large barge. By a strange coincidence, we left from identically the same bit of, bit of beach as we had landed on just 18 weeks before. As I had been the first ashore, I was the last to leave. It was impossible not to help noticing the contrast. That brilliant August morning, the battalion full of fight, high endeavor and 750 strong. Now this dark December night, slinking away under 100 strong, weary, dirty, blase, disillusioned, but yet I was sorry to go. And I think that was true of many of the individuals, not just from the Herefordshire Regiment, but from all of the units at Suvla Bay, who felt that they were letting their comrades down by leaving. The story of the evacuation is probably the success story of Gallipoli. Thousands of tons of stores were destroyed. Over five million rounds of small arms ammunition was sea dumped. I'm told that the Turkish troops on the peninsula did not need to be resupplied until late spring of 1916 because they have captured so much British stores. I even came across one account of a Turkish soldier dying from eating too much captured British marmalade. This graph here shows the monthly strength of the Herefordshire Regiment during their time at Suvla Bay. It's not totally accurate because many of the individuals who were evacuated were re went back to the peninsula within a couple of days. But you can see how the numbers reduced through their period, through their time there. And the high number of those evacuated in November and December, mainly as a result of the storm and the bad weather that they suffered then. On this chart is a summary of the manpower. And you can see there at the top, the number of Herefords that actually served at Suvla Bay, totaling 1,039. 79 were fit and evacuated on the 12th of December. There were 78 fatalities, which means there were 800 
182 men who were evacuated either through sickness or wounds. And the Herefordshire Regiment were not particularly unusual in that number of casualties. There were many other battalions that had similar casualty levels. Those soldiers that died at Gallipoli and were buried there are buried in Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries, as this one in Lalababa. Those soldiers from the Herefordshire Regiment that served at Suvla Bay were entitled to the 1914-15 Star Medal, as shown here. And all of those medals are named on the reverse. And if they are named to the Herefordshire Regiment, then that soldier must have served in Gallipoli because that is the only place they qualified for that medal. I will conclude by just mentioning the Gallipoli Association. It's a great organization which exists to remember, to honor and to study. And if you wish to know more about the Gallipoli campaign, then I would recommend that you uh, join the Gallipoli Association. That concludes my presentation. Uh, what I'm quite happy to do, as long as I can get the technology to work, is to, uh, is to take any questions that you, uh, that you might have. I think, can you see me now? Oh, you're all on, everyone's on mute. We can see you. Right, yes. okay. If anyone has any questions, then I'll be quite happy to uh, do my best to answer them for you. Andy, may I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Um, fantastic talk, very atmospheric and, and, and brilliantly researched. Thank you so much. Um, I'm fascinated that you spoke to some veterans of the campaign. Was there any commemoration to celebrate or to mark the last survivor in Hereford? I'd be interested in that. And also, when you shared the photograph of the three Faulkners and you gave the story about the father who died, did the two sons survive? Uh, um, right, there were several questions there. <laughs> um, the Faulkners to start with, the two brothers, the two sons survived, although St. Charles Faulkner that was um, at Gallipoli and wrote the letter. He died in, uh, on Ross Ranges in 1935 during a, a, a firing camp with the Herefordshire Regiment. So he was a long time serving man. And interesting enough, there was a letter in the Hereford Times about two months ago from from Sergeant Major Faulkner's granddaughter asking for information about her grandfather and um, her, her father. So the family link is still there in the county. Uh, as regards the last survivor from the Gallipoli campaign, uh, I don't know who that was in Herefordshire. Um, I met these um, the veterans in the uh, early to mid 80s uh, I think I spoke to eight or nine veterans. I was then serving overseas for probably the next uh, oh, eight or ten years. And so I was not in contact with them. And when I returned, there, there were none left. So I don't know who the last surviving Herefordshire soldier was. Um, but in the 80s, I think that many of these old soldiers really didn't want to talk too much about their experiences. They, they, they hadn't spoken about them for years and they, they were quite reluctant to speak about their experiences. They took quite a bit of coaxing to, uh, to get them to talk. Thank you. Andy, could you just quickly sketch what happened to the first Herefords after there and up to... Yeah, of course. I mean, when, when they left Gallipoli, they, they, they went to uh, Egypt. <clears throat> it took them about three or four months to be rebuilt as a battalion. Uh, reinforcements from UK and the sick and the wounded really to be recovered from all around the Mediterranean to join them, to bring them back up to strength. 
they then uh, were on the um, the Suez Canal defences and helped defend against the last Turkish assault across the Sinai um, into Egypt or towards Egypt. They then crossed the Sinai Desert and took part in the first, second and third battles of Gaza, which was the coastal strip into Palestine. They then moved into Palestine and were with Allenby when Jerusalem was liberated at Christmas 1917. In July 1918, they were one of the battalions which left the Middle East and they moved to the Western Front and joined the 34th Division and then fought for the last 100 days on the Western Front in the breakout from the, uh, the static trench warfare to the, <coughs> to the east. And then after the armistice, they became part of the army of occupation in the Rhineland. Eventually, they were demobilized in, um, in small numbers until they formed a cadre, which was then absorbed into another battalion. And the colors were returned to Hereford in June 1919 which basically uh, symbol, symbolized their, the end of their First World War mobilized service. Andy, <coughs> Andy can, I, can I just mention about Colonel Drage? Yes, of course. Um, Colonel Drage's nephew was my second reporting officer when I was in the Ministry of Defense. And he was based at um, at uh, Birdcage Bird Barracks up in the Birdcage Barracks up in London, and we used to talk quite a bit about his uncle in the Herefords in the First World War. And I don't know whether he, he always asked me where the medals were, and I thought they were up at Shrewsbury at uh, Five Div. And uh, I know he intended going up one day just to look at the medals. I think that's where they are, aren't they, Colonel Drage's medals? No, not anymore. <laughs> Um, oh, right. <laughs> they, they were in the um, in in the drill hall at uh, at Shrewsbury, but when uh, a couple of years ago, in fact, it was during the centenary of the uh, of the landing at Suvla. So in twenty fifteen, um, it was decided that they, it would be more appropriate if they were in the Herefordshire Regimental Museum, and so Colonel Drage's medals were transferred to us, and they're now held in the Regimental Museum in Suvla Barracks. Thank you. These miniatures are in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> are there any more questions? Hey, Colonel Andy, uh, I would just like to say thank you very much for letting everybody from Six Rifles join, join us tonight, or join you tonight. It's a fascinating um, presentation. And uh, obviously brings some real links to, uh, to you know, modern day six rifles. And obviously the guys we got from, um, you know, from the platoon over there, obviously use, use the drill hall on a, on a weekly basis. Um, just so that if anyone, any of them are interested in, in coming to see the museum, could you tell us sort of, um, obviously if you're open with sort of COVID restrictions and how they can get to come and have a look at the museum, please? Yeah, th thanks Ollie for that. And thanks for the plug for the museum. Um, it, at the moment, unfortunately, the, the museum is closed because of the COVID regulations. Uh, the, the whole, the, the, the museum is located within Suvla Barracks and the whole barracks is effectively um, on reduced manning and closed to outsiders. So we are not over, able to host any visits to the museum at the moment. Uh, we're hoping that uh, we will be able to get back into the museum in the, uh, the new year. Uh, the museum's also in, in a, a, a bit of a state at the moment because we were halfway through a major reorganization of air displays when lockdown appeared. So at the moment, the displays are in a, a bit of a state. So once we are allowed back in, it's going to take us a while to sort out the museum before we're open for business again. But hopefully it will be in the spring and we will publish a note on the website, on the museum website, when we're, we're open again. But because we are located within the Army Reserve Centre, all visitors to the museum 
have to be uh, escorted. So it, it's important that anyone wishing to visit makes an appointment and the appointments can be made on the website so that we can um, facilitate their visit. Uh, thanks, Ollie. Great, thank you. I think you, do, you have got uh, one of the Hereford platoon who's in Cyprus on uh, Op Tosca um, watching. We, we, we did earlier, I don't know. Oh, is excellent. There any, is there anyone uh, from Cyprus with us now at the moment? I don't know if we're still here. No, maybe not, but uh, they're certainly here for some of it. So, yeah, you had uh, had some people watching from obviously uh, quite close to where all this uh, all this happened. Yeah. So, yeah. thanks once again. Thanks, Jolly. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention this evening, and I'm sorry about the uh, the technical hitches. It hasn't gone quite as smooth yet as I would have wished it to have done, but hopefully. Um, I got the, um, the presentation over to you uh, and you, you were able to, uh, to, to enjoy it. And could I, I just say as well that th there, this has been a free presentation, but if anyone would wish to make a donation to the museum, that would be most gratefully received. And the details of how to do that were included in the calling notice. So thank you all very much for your attention and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy, Thank you. very much. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Press that, and that's mute.